I want to talk to you about the, the matter of, of living art. And I would like to put the, the matter in a, in a fairly wide perspective. Now, Dr. Serfeld uh, gave a brilliant lecture here that I think uh, many of you have heard, in which he very carefully and with meticulous scholarship was uh, defining... Uh, no, no, really. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get like Dr. Rookmacher pretty soon and first make you all laugh and then say, stop laughing, because <laughs> that, that's, no, that's no place to laugh. <laughs> that was meticulous scholarship. It was a magnificent uh, work of scholarship. Maybe the thing you were uh, smiling at was uh, the rather advanced vocabulary that Dr. <laughs> Serafelt uses. Uh, I found somebody afterwards who didn't know what the didn't know about the ubiquity of obliquity, and I, <laughs> I had to explain it to him. I, I, <clears throat> but the uh, the 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 matter that Dr. Serafelt presented was a matter of uh, of, of real importance, and uh, you'll notice how how careful, carefully and with what precision uh, he defined. Uh, uh, art and aesthetics, and related it to uh, the art objects that are produced, uh, to our producing of them and our experience, our appreciation of them, and then made that uh, very um, penetrating suggestion about the operation of allusiveness uh, in the structure of artistic endeavor. Now, I would like to... Um, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because I think after Dr. Rookmacher's remarks, uh, I possibly should uh, say this. I would like to talk about how the word beauty is used in the Bible in connection with a presentation of art. And what I'm trying to do, uh, one thing I would want to point out, that the way the word beauty is used in the Bible is much broader than its use in the history of aesthetics. Uh, it's much broader than the use that uh, was, uh, I think, very rightly criticized by Dr. Serafelt um, in uh, a period uh, in which, uh, first of all, the ideals from Platonism and Aristotelianism were drawn uh, into medieval thought and then brought out in the period of Romanticism. But I want to go back a bit uh, and to uh, discuss and consider with you uh, the matter of art in a somewhat deeper sense, in the sense of the heightening and the enriching of our human experience in a lifestyle of worshiping fellowship with the living God. And I do think that this is to be taken seriously because uh, our, our living art, our lifestyle of fellowship with the living God in which we experience this deepening and enriching is, I believe, not just an analogy to art in the life of faith, but rather the religious root of all art. Uh, the joy in God, our creation, uh, our creator, and the joy that we may also have in participation in his creation. And I'd like to uh, think with you a little bit about this tonight. And uh, I think that as we uh, consider it, uh, it will be helpful to us in considering our lives before God in the breadth and depth of our fellowship with him. In the 90th Psalm, uh, Moses writes with great power and beauty and concludes the psalm with an amazing passage. Uh, I won't read the whole psalm here this evening uh, in spite of the, the beauty and integrity of it, but I want to refer to the concluding section. Moses cries out, beginning with verse uh, 13, Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us in the morning with thy loving kindness that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory upon their children. And let the beauty 
of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. There is evident in this passage, I think, a theme that occurs throughout the Bible, the theme that the living God reveals his beauty. And then we see that the living God calls us to live before him, participating in that revelation of his beauty. The living God reveals his beauty in his work of creation. God's work of creation is sealed with God's delight in his creation. We may not pass quickly over the sentence in the book of Genesis that is so often repeated, and God saw that it was good. That's an amazing statement. You see, it isn't describing his work of creation, It isn't precisely a blessing pronounced upon creation, although I think it it implies a blessing, but it speaks to us of God's joy in his creation. It pictures God as contemplating his creation. It pictures God as finding delight in the work of his hands, in that creation uh, which he has produced. And we are reminded that there is visual beauty in God's creation. We're told in the second chapter of Genesis and the ninth verse, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Now you notice what's said there, that it's pleasant to the sight and good for food. Not only good for food, not only of uh, utility, a food, a fruit tree, but also a tree that's good to look at. Now, a fruit-bearing tree would not have to be good to look at. It would not have to be a pleasure to the eyes, a delight to the eyes. But the Lord, in his creation, uh, builds in, you see, many extras. Uh, He gives this aesthetic dimension visually uh, to the trees of his creation. And even the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is described in these terms as being a delight to the eyes. And later in the prophecy of Ezekiel, when he is uh, discussing the kingdoms of this world and their glory, uh, he speaks in these same terms of the beauty of the trees of the Garden of Eden and compares uh, a great kingdom to the flourishing of a tree like the trees of the Garden of Eden. And so, you see, this is an image that's taken for granted by the later prophets, that God put man in a garden that was a place of beauty, that trees in that garden were trees of beauty, and that God, who made his creation, could look at those beautiful trees that he had made, and he could pronounce them very good. And you'll notice that in the work of creation that God pronounced good, there was also the divine ordering of creation. Great emphasis is put on that in the first chapter of Genesis, God's work in dividing, the way he divides light from darkness, day from night, the waters from the waters in the creation of the firmament, the land from the sea. There is design in the structure of God's creation. He creates the animals after their kind, and God uh, prepares his creation uh, with design. And even, I think, a a little note, a little footnote uh, that puts forward uh, the thought that men, too, are going to be designers in God's creation. For why else would we be told that there is gold in Havilah and and that there are precious stones there, Uh, the same gold and precious stones that are later mentioned in connection with the making of the epaulets of the high priest's ephod? Uh, And so God stores creation uh, with the material, you see, for artisanship, a God himself who has designed the world that he has made. And then perhaps another theme that strikes us in the account of creation is the evidence of abundance. There is a prolific provision for all of our needs. 
God creates a living world and life in abounding and abundant forms. And in all of this, God rejoices. God affirms the life that he has made. God affirms the world that he has made. He pronounces it to be very good. And I think it's, it's right for us to understand that as we are made in God's image, whatever mysterious uh, divine satisfaction is expressed in those terms uh, is expressed for our understanding. That if God can look at his creation and pronounce it good, uh, then it's not only possible but important that we should do so that we should be able to share in that vision of the satisfying beauty, uh, the satisfying wonder and glory of the creation of God. And God, who uh, sealed uh, with his delight his work of creation, has also maintained it in judgment. Although man's sin brings the curse into the world, the creation is spared. The garden itself is kept by the sword of the cherubim. The tree of life is preserved. There is to be a future. Uh, There there is to be an eschatology. There's to be a a new heavens and a new earth ultimately. And the creation is preserved and spared. And then after the story of the flood, the, the, the earth is restored. The animals are preserved in pairs. Uh, The dove returns with the olive leaf as the sign of the new creation emerging after the judgment, a restored creation. I don't mean, of course, a new creation in the sense of the creation that God will make altogether new, but a renewed creation that follows the flood, a renewing of life in the world. And then we have this theme of the restoration of God's promise. Uh, God promises a new order, a new order of transcending glory. And uh, as you go through the theology of the Old Testament, it it is a wonderful thing to observe how the prophets use the imagery of the Garden of Eden, the imagery with reference to God's original creation, the imagery uh, of the glory of the world that God has made uh, to describe what God will do at last. For at last, uh, there will be the tree of life again. There will be the water of life flowing forth from the throne of God and the tree of life with the leaves for the healing of the nations. Uh, And there will be a new order. And it's all brought together in a beautiful way. Uh, A garden, yes. A sanctuary, yes. A city, yes. Uh, A wonderful unfolding and developing of a fullness uh, of a new creation. And, of course, not only a new order, but new life abounding in the order. The bounty of nature is described in terms of the blessings that God will at last pour out. Oh, for example, the little passage in the ninth chapter of Amos, where we have the picture of the plowman overtaking the reaper and uh, those who are harvesting the grapes catching up on those who are sowing the seed. (laughs) Very rapid growth there. Uh, A beautiful picture of how the Lord uh, is the Lord of creation, the Lord of creation's design and prodigal abundance, and how at last God's blessing will rest upon his creation. And of course, all of that promise of blessing in creation is never abstracted from God the creator. God himself who made the world is the one who was going to come and the trees of the field are the trees that clap their hands before the Lord because he cometh. And it's God's coming that is the secret of all of this glory of restoration. It's also true that we find in the Bible uh, that God reveals his beauty not just in his work of creation but also in his work of redemption, in his work of salvation. Now, of course, this implies a a long story that I suppose most of us have uh, considerable knowledge of, the whole story of God's calling uh, to man and God's covenant with man, the fact that man is put in the world as God's image bearer, that he's called to a personal fellowship with God and, God, and man is made male and female and called to corporate fellowship with God, service together uh, in creation. And the call also comes to man uh, after the fall. God comes seeking Adam in the garden. And to the sinner, the call of God is renewed 
out of God's free grace and mercy. Uh, God spares, God restrains judgment. And we have this very interesting touch that in the line of Cain, in the line uh, of those who have rebelled against God and are driven forth from his presence. Nevertheless, uh, God does not pour out that utter destruction that would be the proper uh, desert and consequence of men's sin, but that especially and exactly in the line of Cain, uh, God shows that his purposes are still being maintained. The earth is still being developed. Uh, that uh, there are those in the line of Cain who develop culture, and Jubal is the father of all such as Handel, the harp, uh, and the pipe. Uh, It's particularly interesting, these accounts in Genesis, uh, about uh, culture in the line of Cain. It's particularly interesting because it contrasts in such a marked manner uh, with Near Eastern mythology, As in uh, most primitive mythology, Near Eastern mythology also uh, presents a picture of uh, gods as culture bringers. And the birth of the gods, the genealogy of the gods, is made to be a description of the origin of culture. So particular cultural blessings are brought to men uh, by the gods and by the birth of the gods. But you see, in the book of Genesis, in strong contrast to that, it's made clear that the bringing in of culture is man's work. God has charged man to be a culture maker. And therefore, it is not by gods or by demigods uh, that culture is brought into the world, but it is by the work of men who build cities, who learn to forge metals, and who develop, therefore, uh, instruments uh, of music. Sadly, also, instruments of warfare, and so you have the sword and the song of Lamech uh, in that same account. Uh, Men use their devices for sinful purposes, and yet it's quite clear that these gifts of culture in the biblical account are, are not ascribed as in mythology, to some uh, divine genealogy, but they are, as in the Sumerian myths, for example, but they are ascribed uh, to men who develop the world that God has given them. Now God then, who spares men, who does not pour out his judgment at once, is sparing them with a purpose. He's sparing them in order that he might bring in his great promises of salvation in order that there might unfold the great history of redemption that we have in the scripture. God then, in his work of salvation, calls men and calls them to himself and gives them the promise uh, of his final and full deliverance and restoration. Now, uh, let's look uh, for a moment at this uh, verse to which I called your attention in the 90th Psalm where the prayer of Moses is, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Now that's not only a beautiful prayer, but one that's particularly striking in the setting. Moses is writing as one who leads a generation in the wilderness, a generation that's going to perish in the wilderness. And the 90th Psalm presents with power uh, that a dreadful situation of Israel, uh, how they are turned to destruction. And God says to them in judgment, return, ye children of men. They are turned back in order that they might be consumed in the desert. And we are told that it is because of God's wrath that they are troubled, that God has set our iniquities before him, our secret sins in the light of his countenance. And so Moses describes this human existence in terms of brevity. Our life is like a sigh and it's gone. And then he describes it in contrast to God's eternity. But against this background, Moses prays for mercy. Moses who says that God has pronounced the judgment, the sentence saying, return ye children of men. Now Moses prays to God And he says, return, O Lord, how long? 
Not that men should be returned under judgment to death in the wilderness, but that God should return in grace and mercy and deliver his people. And it's there that Moses prays that the beauty of God might rest upon them and that the glory of God might rest upon their children. What an amazing prayer. And he prays, establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Now, a generation in the wilderness, what would the work of their hands mean, you know? Uh, What cultural monuments would be left uh, among the rocks of Sinai? How could the work of their hands be established? Sorry, um, the um, art museum in Philadelphia is closed during the time that you're here. Uh, it's not just Westminster that doesn't always have things organized, uh, but uh, uh, perhaps some of you have been down to the um, Rodin Museum in Philadelphia, and it's always striking to me uh, to see those great sculpture, uh, those immense works uh, by Rodin. And you know there's such a massivity to them, (laughs) and you, you think they're going to stay for a while. They'll stay put. Uh, the, the thinker out there, you know, surveying the, the traffic and all on, on the parkway, he, uh, you, you got the feeling he's going to stay there for a while. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you, as you see where the very uh, finger marks of Rodin ha- have been uh, left in the clay and then uh, cast in bronze, uh, you know, you can just see there his thumb went by, uh, the work of his hand. Uh, it, it endures, it stands, you know. And uh, maybe we would like, in a way, to participate in that. We would like to have the feeling that the work of our hands uh, will be, as it were, cast in bronze to endure forever. Uh, but uh, Moses' prayer is, of a wilderness generation, those who are going to die in the desert, his prayer for them is that the work of their hands might be established. Established by God given eternal significance. And then it's in that connection that he prays that the beauty of God might crown him and his generation. The beauty of God be given to these wilderness wanderers walking under the doom of destruction. The prayer that God's grace will reverse the situation and give meaning and abiding beauty to these pilgrims uh, of the people of God. Now, uh, There are many terms for beauty that are used in the Old Testament and a number of them, too, that are applied in various ways to God and his works. Now, one class of such terms is the term for majestic beauty, the beauty of majesty. Uh, God dwells among his people. He dwells in beauty. The tabernacle is constructed with beauty by skilled craftsmen uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom in order that they might work with skill and artistry uh, in the making and the fabricating of the tabernacle. And the God who comes to dwell in that place of beauty is a God who descends in a cloud of glory. And one aspect of the beauty of God, as you see it in the Old Testament, is in terms of this majestic glory. In Isaiah 60, 19, the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light to thee, but the Lord will be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God, thy glory. And here that word is translated glory, but it's sometimes translated beauty, the majestic glory, the beauty of God like the beauty of the cloud. In that day will the Lord of hosts become a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty, Isaiah 28, verse 5. Uh, Other terms that are used in the Old Testament refer to the beauty of intelligent design the kind of beauty that you find in the breastplate of the high priest. And this term is used for the works of the Lord. Uh, In verse 16 of Psalm 90, let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. The word translated glory there is a word that's often associated with this beauty of design. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And that's a difficult phrase to translate. Could be holy array. But it's the idea of of design, of of having built together a patterning uh, which results in beauty. Um, 
I, I suppose uh, the kind of uh, majestic uh, display and pomp and panoply that we still uh, associate at times with ceremonial occasions uh, would sometimes be associated with this thought of, of the beauty of, uh, of a display. But, but the term itself has the thought of intelligent design. And then the third uh, class of terms for beauty are those which refer to the beauty of delight. Uh, the beauty uh, that one person may find in another, a woman's beauty, a man's beauty, the beauty of a landscape. And we read in Psalm 27, 4, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to consider his temple. The beauty of the Lord that's used in this verse, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, is this beauty of favor. It's the beauty of grace, the beauty of pleasantness, the beauty uh, in which we find restful delight and uh, as well as a, a, a thrilling uh, perception. So you have these terms for beauty, the beauty of majestic glory, of intelligent design, the beauty of delight and of fellowship. And all are used in relation to God. Now, God dwelt with his people in the tabernacle, the God of glory, the God of the cloud, the God of the hangings woven skillfully, and the God of grace who called his people to himself that they might bear his name. And it's that God who comes to dwell with us in Jesus Christ. It's that God who showed the beauty of his majesty in the transfiguration of Jesus Christ in the mountain. It's that God who has shown the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And as we come to Jesus Christ, we come to the Lord of glory. We come to the one who is filled with the, the light of the glory of God. And the beauty of holy array is the beauty of Jesus Christ, the priest of heaven. Uh, the one who, is, who has all the wisdom of God. And if uh, God's beauty as a beauty of design is a reflection of the divine wisdom, of the divine ordering of all things, then that comes to full manifestation in Jesus Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then, of course, the beauty of grace is revealed in Jesus Christ. We're told in Isaiah 4.2, in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. Over all, it, it says, glory will be for a covering. And Jesus Christ, who is the branch, the root of David, the branch of God's choosing, is the one who is the branch of beauty and glory, the beauty and glory of grace. Now, of course, you know that it's this Jesus Christ of whom the prophet says, that he has no beauty, that there is no beauty that we should desire him. This Jesus Christ, who was made so hideous in his sufferings that he seemed to be completely dehumanized. Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, indeed, made to be a spectacle and, and uh, dehumanized uh, in his wounding. Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, indeed, made to be a spectacle and, and uh, dehumanized uh, in his wounding. Jesus Christ, in that agony, in that suffering, brings to us uh, the fullness of beauty. For the, the psalm, uh, the 90th psalm, uh, cries out, Who knoweth the power of thine anger and thy wrath according to the fear that is due unto thee? And the answer that is given in the New Testament is Jesus Christ. Who knows God's wrath poured out? Jesus Christ does upon the cross. For he is made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And the one who is the king of beauty and grace, the one who is the fairest of 10,000 to our souls, in him it is fulfilled, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. But the mystery of the Old Testament is that when we see the king in his beauty, first of all, we see him not in the beauty of resurrection glory, 
but we see the king in his beauty as he suffers on the cross, as there his obedience is made perfect, as there his love is made perfect, as there he gives himself for his people. Now, I'm not speaking of that in in an effort to draw general principles from it. I'm merely pointing out that God, in the wonder of his glory, manifests the beauty of his grace in the fact that Jesus Christ bears our sins in his own body on the tree. How, then, are we, as the people of God, to receive, uh, to walk in, to to perceive, and and to uh, manifest uh, this beauty. The, the psalmist prays that this beauty might be upon us. He prays that the work of our hands might be established upon us. And here I want to make some suggestions. Uh, I think that last night Dr. Seraphelt set forth very powerfully the importance of living in beauty uh, in daily life. And some of the things that I had hoped to say are are not at all necessary to be said now. You've heard them very powerfully stated. But I would like to make some observations about the meaning of our living in this beauty of the Lord, of bringing to expression this beauty uh, in our fellowship before him. Of course, first, we must perceive beauty. And our aesthetic experience responds, I think, first of all, to the depth of wonder of God's revelation. You know, uh, in our ethical life, we love. We are called to love. But we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. And in our cognitive life, in our knowing, We are called to know, first of all, the Lord, to know the Lord, and then to know and to perceive and to have wisdom in the world in which God has put us. And I would suggest that the same thing is true, too, in our aesthetic life, that first of all, we are to rejoice in the Lord. First of all, we experience the very fountain of aesthetic delight in terms of our fellowship with God himself and the joy that we know in knowing him. You see, there is this abounding fullness of God's revelation. We are being continually surprised by joy. There are always those extra perceptions that are forced in upon us from the richness and the fullness of God's work in this world that he has created. The relation of form to function as we perceive it in the leap of a deer, the symmetry of an animal, the beauty of a flower. Uh, These things, uh, I believe, are driven home to the Christian uh, continually as showing level upon level, layer upon layer in in a wonderful uh, Arabic of richness, all the fullness of that which God has done. Uh, There's always more. And and as we perceive the richness, it's not just that you see more, as it were, quantitatively. It's as you you see, uh, you perceive also from completely different perspectives. And whole new perspectives are opened up uh, to you. There is a perception of richness that is at the same time a perception of simplicity. Uh, The multidimensional discovery that we make uh, as we look at God's uh, creation from yet another plane and from yet another uh, point of view. Uh, A tremendous richness and plurality that also is drawn together in a unity in the harmony of design. And and I think that uh, this is a profound experience. Uh, And, of course, it has an apostate direction. Uh, Of course, men who are made in the image of God... Uh, may not love God. They may, in rebellion, direct their love elsewhere and not obey him. Uh, They may not direct their minds to the knowledge of God, but to the knowledge of other things. And they may not find joy in God. But just as the Christian, whose heart is filled with the knowledge of the Lord, uh, will also love the Lord and respond ethically, and just as all of our ethical obedience and all of our knowledge is grounded first in our relationship to God, then this is true, too, with respect to the aesthetic dimension of our experience. And then further, God's beauty is reflected in us and by us. There is a creaturely creativity. 
And just as God works in such great abundance and with such richness of design, so he gives to us in a measure as his creatures uh, also to work, uh, as it were, in many levels, to work richly and to work with profound implication in his creation. And God calls us to doxological living. God calls us to obedience with the depth of the dimension of praise. God calls us to a living that is a living plus. God calls us to a living that is a rejoicing in him. And God calls to a rejoicing that is a rejoicing to the fullness and the richness of his creation, not just in the sense of the world that's created out there, but in the sense of our own being and our new being in Jesus Christ. Uh, The total fullness of our experience given to us by God uh, becomes the medium in which we are called to be creative and to be creative in God's image. Now, it might almost seem presumption, you know. If God is the creator, how can we presume to create anything? Uh, What could we possibly uh, bring to him? Uh, It's a bouquet of flowers that we pick to give to the gardener, uh, only more than the gardener, the very creator of the garden, you know. Uh, but, But he's made us this way in order that we might perceive these things and in order that we might bring them to him. And that's why I think there was such uh, real profundity in what might appear to have been a rather simple suggestion on Dr. Seerfeld's part when he spoke of allusion as he did. Uh, And you see how this uh, manifests our creativity as we uh, working uh, in the creation and in the experience that's given to us of God, we can bring by illusion this multi-level characteristic that is that must always be found in aesthetic experience in the broadest sense. You see, um, if you just need to have a cup that you can drink a water out of. It has to have a certain form if it's going to be a cup. But if you're going to make the cup in such a way that the cup also has a, a decorative quality, if you're going to make the cup in such a way that it also becomes a delight to the eyes as well as a conveyor of liquid to the mouth, uh, you've given to that cup another dimension. And then, of course, there, there, there's the possibility of ha- having had a second dimension uh, to introduce also other elements, overtones of symbolism and suggestiveness, the elusive quality uh, in which uh, you call into the picture something beyond that, which is the simple statement of that which is made. Well, now, all this reflection of beauty is part of the way in which we are enabled to serve the Lord God creator because of the rich of his creation. And then we can share this beauty uh, with uh, others as we work together and share it also before God rejoicing in him. There is a heightening in producing. There is a heightening in receiving. And I don't think that those who have written in the field of aesthetics Uh, stressing uh, the heightening and the intensification of experience. Uh, I don't think that those comments are are out of order. Uh, I think this is true. I think that there is a certain heightening that's involved in the aesthetic experience. Uh, It's something that's involved with perceiving the richness, perceiving the depth, and I believe perceiving also the God-grounded reality in which all of this takes place. For the final allusion that delights the heart of the Christian is the allusion to God himself, to God's presence, who is the creator and source from which the possibility of all our experience flows as new creatures in Christ Jesus. And of course, all experience in the world uh, has to be derived from his creative ordinance. And then the the matter of significance, of of vision and meaning uh, is the way in which we apply and perceive this beauty as over against a mere formalism in art uh, or an approach to art that would just see Uh, a picture, a painting, for example, in terms of formal dimensions, uh, we as Christians must see it in a broader context. Uh, We must take seriously, as you've heard Dr. Ruckmacher say, the the history of art uh, so that you perceive something of the meaning and understanding that those had who were creators of art art works in other periods. 
And we have to understand that we, as creatures of God, in the fullness of our experience, necessarily work in a context where there is a framework of depth of meaning. And, of course, the symbolism itself, that associative heightening in which there is a kind of communication. I don't mean just in in symbols uh, of uh, a very open and obvious sort, but I mean the suggestiveness uh, of presentational symbolism. Uh, You know, Suzanne Langer has spoken of the difference between the discursive and the presentational symbols, the difference between the kind of symbolism that's used in language and the kind of symbolism that's used in the visual arts and in music. And I think here, too, uh, we understand, again, the, the idea that there are the dimensions of the richness of experience given to us of God. Now, friends, uh, my, my concern uh, as we speak of this is that you should consider what it means to receive from God the richness of experience in the world of his creation, the richness of an experience in the world for which God has given his word of promise, the promise of a new creation, the richness of experience in a world that's given to us by Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and who calls us to serve him and to be his people in this world. We do not, of course, make our joy, our delight in the Lord, even in its profoundest religious sense, we do not make this the totality of our obedience. Because the Lord God calls us to serve him. He calls us to serve him in Christ's kingdom. He gives us an order of priorities in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in the order of priorities that we are given, uh, we are given the marching order of our Lord and Savior in the Great Commission. And yet, while we do serve him in the Great Commission to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, it is also true that that great commission, the fulfilling of all the commandments of Jesus Christ, requires of us not only that we respect priorities, not only that we seek and save that which is lost in Jesus' name, but also that we fulfill all the fullness of God's commandments, that we take seriously what it means to live before God in this world, returning the praise to our creator that is his due. And you see, it isn't at last just that we miss so much from life if we drop out, as it were, one dimension, It is not just that our life becomes stark and uh, diminished, but it's more than that. It's that we owe to the Lord our God the fullness of a living joy before him in which our attitude is continually one of grateful praise, blessing the name of our creator for everything that he's given us, uh, delighting in it even as we go forward in his service. Moses prayed, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. He prayed it as a blessing for life in the wilderness. And his prayer was, establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. My Christian friend, fill your hands with the work of the Lord. Dedicate to him that which you do. Whatever it is, whether it's in words and deeds, whether it's in paintings or words of gospel testimony, whether it's in music or in dance, whatever you are doing, do it as unto the Lord. Do it with all your might and do it understanding that the Lord has called you to a life which in the midst of suffering is yet a life of joy, a life which while it proclaims the gospel to a generation dying in the wilderness, can yet speak of the beauty of the Lord, a life which knows beauty, not just in the God of creation, but a life which knows beauty in the suffering Savior, who gave his life and rose again, that we might be brought to that last great festival feast in the house of God forever. Shall we pray? 
Our Heavenly Father, how we do praise Thee for the fullness of Thy creation. And Lord, how we do praise Thee for the fullness of Thy grace. How we praise Thee for the fullness of Thy word. Lead us, Lord. Help us to meditate. Draw us on that we will see ever more of the great vision of life that is redeemed in this world of sin and death, that we might be living witnesses. Yes, Lord, that upon us there might be established the work of our hands. And even more, O Lord our God, that upon us there might rest the benediction of thy beauty. We ask it in our Savior's name. Amen.